Hello, everyone. My name is Kaya Motter, and I'm a publisher at Elsevier. I would like to welcome you to this webinar hosted by the journal Mutation Research, Genetic Toxicology, and Environmental Mutagenesis, entitled The Comet Assay, A Versatile and Sensitive Technique for the Assessment of DNA Damage and Repair. Thank you very much to our sponsors at Andor for making this event possible. Before we begin, let me remind the audience that we will have questions and answers a question and answer session following the presentations. Please submit your questions at any time during the presentation using the Ask a Question button at the right-hand corner of your screen. I would encourage you to input questions as and when you think of them. These will be addressed in the Q&A session at the end. The more questions asked, the better the session will be. And now it is my pleasure to introduce and welcome today's first speaker, Professor Diana Anderson. Professor Diana Anderson is a professor of biomedical science at Bradford School of Medical Sciences. She examined the differences in the sensitivity to genomic damage of lymphocytes harvested from cancer patients, pre-suspect cancer patients, and normal healthy volunteers. She discovered that genomic damage in lymphocytes from cancer patient samples plateaued and did not increase at UVA as UVA intensity decreased. In contrast, lymphocyte response patterns for healthy individuals returned towards control values as UVA intensity decreased. So without any further hesitation, I would like to hand over to Dr. Anderson to begin her presentation. My name is Professor Diana Anderson, and I'm going to talk to you today about the sensitivity and specificity of the empirical lymphocyte genome sensitivity assay and its implications for improving cancer, human cancer diagnostics. A simple, uh, start, a simple uh, way of saying this is detecting cancer risk with a blood test. Now, I come from the Faculty of Medical Sciences at the University of Bradford, and the colleagues involved in this work are all shown here. You can see um, Dr. Nadjasada and Rajendran Gopalan and Deeri Gadiri and Andy Scally, Stephen Britland, come from Bradford University and Morgan Denya. The other people on this uh, program are the consultants at the hospital, Bradford Royal Infirmary, and this is a joint effort. Uh, I'm going to introduce this. Cancer Research UK reports that the lifetime risk of cancer has increased from 25% in 1975 to 45% in 2009, and by 2027, they reckon it will be 50%. And that means one in two people will get it. In the past decade, cancer cases increased from 250,000 cases per year to 270,000. In the USA, cancer costs are this amount, 1 to 4.6 billion in 2010, rising to over 170 billion by 2020. That's a lot of money. Now, therefore, there is need for assays to detect early stage cancers and cancer sensitive individuals. This would be very useful if this could happen. This study examined differences in the sensitivity to genomic damage of human lymphocytes in a modified comet assay. Uh, this comet assay um, has really come into its own in the last two decades, or maybe two and a half. But it's the most used assay in uh, toxicology just about at the moment. The lymphocytes that we're going to use in this assay were derived from cancer patients or people with pre-suspect pre-cancer or, pre or suspected cancer patients and normal healthy volunteers. Just go back a moment. And then 
This is a picture of what a comet looks like. Let me move back. Here you can see a lymphocyte with little damage. And here you can see a lymphocyte with quite a lot of damage. And here you can see a lymphocyte with intermediate damage. And those are the sorts of comets we'll be looking at. For this, we used Andor uh, Comet 4. This is a diagrammatic representation of how the comets are formed. You can see a normal slide, and then you can see the first, we put a layer of normal melting point agarose on it. The second layer of LMP agarose, low melting points in this case, with damaged and undamaged cells, and then a third layer of low melting point agarose on top, and then finally a cover slip. But you put these electrophoresis solution and damaged DNA moves, uh, uh, actually moves from the anode, sorry, here, from the minus to the positive, to the anode. Let's try and find my you see, that, just show you here, it's fairly straightforward to the positive end. And the reason it's called this is because it looks exactly like Halley's Comet, and that's why it's got its name. The next one, these are the methods that we used. We investigated 1,040 data sets each of 100 cells from 208 individuals, and each individual had five observations. In this study, we looked at 20 melanoma patients, 34 colon cancer patients, and five lung cancer, with a total of 58 patients. We looked at 18 suspected melanoma patients, 20 polyposis coli patients, and 10 chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, 56 suspected cancer patients in total, and healthy individuals, 94. In order to do a study like this, we had to carry out these studies um, with ethical permission. And three ethics committees were involved the University of Bradford Ethical Committee for Healthy Volunteers, and there's the reference number, the Bradford uh, NHS REC, the, uh, that stands for Research Ethics Committee, and here you've got the numbers for that, for suspected melanoma and melanoma patients, and this one for polyposis and colon cancer patients. We also got permission from LEAD Central NHS REC for respiratory disease patients. So you, you can't do any work without human, with humans anymore without ethical permission. Uh, you have to be very careful about obtaining the correct ethical uh, permission. Now, the data were analyzed using a natural logarithm of the olive tail moment. The data in the comet assay tend to be skewed, so um, we use the logs. And this was plotted for exposure to UVA through five different agar depths, 100 cell measurements per depth, giving us those 1040 values. And it was analyzed using a repeated uh, measures regression model. Now, in when you're analyzing comet data, you tend to uh, be concerned also about tail DNA. And the scientists who work with the comet argue which is the better parameter. So rather than have uh, arguments, we use both parameters to see how they came, uh, what happened. These are the first or well, these are the data sets that we got. 
if you look, uh, let me say, I'm saying to you, if you look, just move this. This is the first uh, set of data with the skin cancers. And here you can see the controls. Here, and this was done as an egg at depth of 100 uh, micro, micromoles. And here you can see the UVA-treated uh, positive control. So here's the negative control. Here's the positive control. And these are the three other agar depths that we used, 200, 300, and 400. So that's the control pattern. Then we looked at the uh, people who were pre-suspected, pre-melanoma. Here you can see this pattern again, the control. There, treatment with UV light. And here we've got uh, three different agar depths, 200, 300, and 400. Now, look at the next one. And here you can see control again, UVA treated, and the three different agar depths. And what you can see here, I think, is a different pattern from what you can see over here, which tends to go down. Let's move on to the colon cancer. Here you can see the control, the positive control, that the first one was the negative control, the positive control, and here, three different day guard depths. Let us move on to the pre-cancerous or suspect cancer. And here, you can see the control, UV at 100, and at different depths. And let us look at the colon cancers, control, and here at the different depths. You can see there's a different pattern. Just <laughs> I think you can see it's different from this response here. Let's go on to lung cancers. Here, uh, what I should say about the colon cancer, let me just go back to that. This was polyposis, uh, where people who have polyposis often tend to have, uh, before they have colon cancer. Let us now move on to the lung cancer. Control, UV irradiated, and here, the different depths. Here, we used COPD, which some people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease can go on to develop uh, lung cancer if they don't die of emphysema. Now, we only had four lung cancer patient positives, but I think you can see, again, uh, a, a different pattern, but there are only four there. But if you add all these data together, here's your control, here's your UV treated, and the control values 94 uh, returning back. All your cancers added together, that's the skin cancer, colon cancer, and lung cancer. I think you can see there's an intermediate response here and the lung cancer, or well, sorry, all the cancers are different. Now, just by looking at that, I think you can, I can see it, but I've looked at it a long time. There is a different response between the cancers and the uh, values here in the control and the pre-suspected cancers. There's another way of showing this. And this is when you take the mean olive tail moment model estimated, and the depth of lymphocytes in the agar gel in here. And what comes across very clearly is that there are three distinct levels. These are all the data added together, as was in the last slide. The control with the confidence limit here, and the bars, and so on. And look at the pattern that you get for the cancers they tend to stay to plateau, whereas the controls tend to come back towards control levels. And the suspect or precancerous states 
tend to have an intermediate position. And it's quite clear, I think, from here, uh, that you can see three distinct patterns. Now, here, these three levels uh, were spotted earlier in a paper by Mojgan Najasada, um, who was the second author on this paper. But all these have been done also, and which gives us our distinct, they weren't published in the original paper, come along like this, and you can see those patterns. And when we were getting those patterns, um, we consulted um, our statistician and thought, gosh, if we get patterns like this, maybe you could use them for a diagnostic uh, tool, as a diagnostic tool. One thing before we go any further, I want to show you the difference between the olive tail moments and the tail DNA, percentage tail DNA. I think there is quite good separation between the control and the precancerous or suspect cancers and the cancer. Three distinct, with the box whisker plots, do show this distinct uh, difference between. If you do you just use the percentage tail DNA, you get exactly the same sort of pattern, but the separation is not quite, it's not quite as clear. Let's go back and just look at the olive tail moments again. You can see here that there is a, a good separation, whereas here with the control, there's a bit more of an overlap. Let me just move that down. A robe movement there. You can see that there is more of an overlap, but the pattern of response is the same. Whichever parameter you use, Now, what do we do with the data, and how can they be analyzed? Now, what we want to know is if you can determine if the differences could have a cancer diagnostic value via analysis of receiver operating characteristic curves in 208 people. Um, now, 208 people doesn't seem very many if you would thinking about this in terms of epidemiology. But in terms of this scientific study, you will see it's quite clear in a moment. So we looked at receiver operating characteristic curves and we used a regression analysis approach as well. And uh, using these two approaches, then we were able to actually come up with some answers. You just see it's a logistic regression analysis and rock analysis. These are the curves, the rock analysis. You're looking at the areas under the curves. Let us go to this first one. This is when you add all the cancer plus pre-cancer together versus the control. The next one is the cancer versus pre-cancer plus the control. And the last one is cancer versus control. Just look at these individually. You've got the sensitivity and specificity involved in this. I'll explain that in a little more detail later. But what you want when you plot a curve in this way is for the optimal would be to go right up into this corner here and then across the top. The same, up into the corner and across the top. The one that approaches this, doesn't quite go up, is this one, cancer versus control. But they're all pretty good. Um, the values that we have here, the area under the rock curve is 0 0.87, 0 0.8, 0.93. What does that mean? If you think, um, and this is not to undermine other things, but for example, prostate cancer at the moment 
comes, if I was to draw this, comes sort of like that. Perhaps I'm not drawing it well enough, but it's not quite, doesn't approach the sort of sensitivity that you can get from this. So, often, looking at this one here, the cancer, in terms of biology, this is quite amazing to have this high value here. Right, let's move on to the next one. So the rock curve responses. The mean olive, uh, the mean log of the olive tail moments gave a value of the area under the rock, of, of the rock curve of, I've just said all this to you, but 0.87 and the confidence intervals are here for all, for all cancers plus pre-suspected cancer versus controls. The next one is 0.89, 95% confidence interval, 0.83, 0.95 for cancer versus pre-suspected cancer plus controls. The last one is 0.93, 95% confidence interval, 0.88 to 0.98 for cancer alone versus controls. And this is... Um, where we excluded the pre-cancer or the <coughs> suspect cancer. So this value is really good. When you think that most biological experiments, when they're carried out to the very best of everyone's ability, you can't get much beyond 9.9. Uh, 9. This is up at 0.93. And all three values are at that level of significance, 0.001, which is very high. It could have more noughts in there, but we, that's how you write it conventionally. Let's have the next slide. I said I talked to you about the sensitivity and the specificity of the results. Give the arrow pointer in again. I can get it in. Here it is, done upon. Now, sensitivity is the true positive times 100 over the true positive plus the false negatives. The specificity, in other words, how many people have cancer? The specificity, how many people don't have cancer, is the true negatives times 100 over the false positive times the true negative. So TP equals true positives, TN equals true negatives, Fn equal false negatives, and Fp equals false positives. The sensitivity and the specificity of the assay was modeled using different threshold levels, enabling optimum identification of only cancer patients and only healthy individuals using the above formula. So that's what we used, and this is used in all these short-term tests for detecting, um, for determining whether there are any use for cancer detection. And that sort of approach has been used for the last 30 years. So it's fairly robust. Now, this might be a little tricky to understand, but it'll be much clearer in the next slide. So here we've got sensitivity over specificity. Here we are, these colors, and we have to work the probability cutoff. What does that mean? So we tried three points here. If you had a, where would these values be? Which is the right one to use? And so on. Which one should we, let, let me show you the next slide, because these are the three values we looked at, 10, 25, and 50. Let me show you in the next slide. We took a low threshold, and we took a high threshold. Now, when you've got that high threshold, above the upper threshold, which is 1.99, which could have been worked out from the previous slide, 
there are very few false positives. These are the occasional outliers, but there are very few false positives. And what we've got here is the control and the pre or suspect cancer patients and the cancer patients. And here, if we have a low threshold, the, there are very few false negatives. Now, that's what everybody wants, few false negatives and few false positives. You don't want to be told that you're prone to cancer if you're not. So you have to have a model which has the best um, separation in the groups. So this is really quite a good separation. So the results suggest that there are differences uh, in lymphocyte sensitivity to UVA, um, which enables discrimination between cancer patients, pre-suspected cancer patients, and healthy volunteers. This relationship could be used in an assay that functions alone as a standalone test or as a possible adjunct to other tests as part of a detection program for cancer. Because it is so new, most people would be nervous at this point in time, perhaps, to use it as a standalone test. Let me just move back a moment. Uh, it can be used, uh, if you let's think about breast cancer, if you've had a breast cancer test and there's a lump in your breast and you're worried about it and might have been, the mammogram might have been a fault or you don't know, but you're having to wait to have another test to check up, um, you could have in that breast, you could have a blocked milk duct, you could have a calcium lump, you could have a cyst. It would be very nice to know, if you did this test, whether the test you have done could throw some light on that situation. It could be, as I say, one of the three other things other than uh, cancer of the breast. So if you got a negative with this, it might suggest that it's one of these other things, like a cyst, like calcium uh, lump, or a blocked milk duct. Again, you need to have confidence in this to be able to use it in that way. Another way you could use it, if you have prostate cancer, you could actually uh, have a look, have a check on that, and check whether you, if you had to go back into hospital, um, you might have to have another test. But if you could have this test done, it might tell you that you might not need to worry to have a second uh, look in that way. So it's for early diagnosis, it's to help, it could be helpful to other uh, cancers. The cancer tests that are being done out there at present, generally looking at the genes that are involved in cancer. And these are quite expensive tests, and you might need several different tests to tell you if it was a cancer, what cancer it was. This test is different in that it just tells a person if they're susceptible to cancer or if they're likely to get cancer, whereas the uh, our test um, can be used as a sort of pre-screen. Eventually, as I say, it might be used as a standalone. But the other tests that are being done with the, the expensive cancer test um, they also have high sensitivities and specificities, but you have to do several of them to get the information that you might get from here. Anyway, these are early days. We're in the process of clinical trials at the moment, and we are getting uh, interesting data, which is supporting the uh, findings of this study. Um, it is, we, people say, what is the mechanism? The thing about this study is it's empirical. You don't have to know what the mechanism is. Um, I know people find that hard to understand. Uh, we're using this just as uh, an assay without knowing what causes it. It could be any of the things that are there. 
repair defects, all sorts of things. It doesn't matter. It just correlates very well with uh, the cancer that a person might get. So let me just put on the last slide. Back again. We are grateful uh, for the support from the research and knowledge transfer support at the University of Bradford. Uh, I should also say we could not have done this work without the consultants at the hospital giving us the blood samples. Treatments were not involved because the patients were taken at um, a pre-treatment stage. They didn't actually um, have treatment. It was before that. So we didn't have the complications of treatment from the patients. Uh, Yorkshire concept also Help this is a very local event, and Yorkshire Forward Enterprise Fellowship. We used UV because it is very um, a generic mutagen. It can detect all sorts of damage, whatever you have. Uh, it, there's literature out there supporting that. Uh, we are trying to get this um, filed internationally. The idea of the people uh, who are working now to take this forward as a commercial assay uh, is that it should be in, a patent in every uh, part of the world if people are interested in this. After this was published, we had letters from all over saying how useful it would be, particularly from underdeveloped countries. So it does have a lot of promise. We can't promise everything, but it's a good test well on the way uh, to helping mankind or womankind, whatever. So at this point, thank you for your attention, and I hope you find this presentation clear. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Anderson, for your presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce and welcome today's second speaker, Marie Vasquez. Marie is an operations director at Helix3, a contract research organization specializing in GLP method development and comet assay applications. Marie studied zoology at NC State University and held research positions in molecular biology at NIEHS and UNC before joining Raymond Tice at Integrated Laboratory Systems, ILS to develop the in vivo comet assay in 1994. She went on to manage the genetic toxicology division at ILS before founding Helix3 in 2003. I would like to hand over to Marie now to begin her presentation. So the name of my talk is the in vivo comet design, comet assay, it's all in the design. The reason I'm speaking about this topic is because the Comet assay is such a flexible assay that it, the design can be a bit of a moving target depending on the characterization of the test compound or the exposure conditions that you're evaluating. For the purposes of my talk, I'll be discussing um, the dose selection, exposure conditions, and the tissue selection um, aspects of the study design. So as you can see by this diagram specifically, the DNA damage most likely to impact uh, the comet assay is going to be, occur before necrosis and apoptosis is evident, before the cell membrane um, integrity is lost. So it is important when selecting your doses that your toxicity tests or your dose range finder includes evaluations of these aspects, the pre-lethal events um, of cell um, death. As you can see by this diagram, the way the biomarkers for those pre-lethal events can be measured both by diffusion assay, where you're looking at levels of diffusion in comet assay slides that have not undergone electrophoresis, and you could also see them in the histopathology, but rather than looking for apoptosis, you can look for decreased ATP and glycogen depletion, as well as very low levels of inflammation are more likely, as I said, um, to impact DNA migration in the comet assay. One of the other aspects of the exposure conditions that you need to watch out for in your study design is the duration of your exposure or the number of daily dose administrations that you use for your study. 
as you can see by this diagram that is universal for all tissues, it is a timeline for tissue repair, you can see based on the timeline that the most, once the injury occurs, most of the DNA damage is, going, is most likely to be detectable within the first three days after injury. After that event, once you start seeing cell proliferation and the remodeling phases, you'll see the DNA migration levels actually decrease as the t tissue repairs. By 15 days, most of that DNA migration detectable by comet may be lost or undetectable unless you have a cumulative response with multiple doses. So this is something you want to consider as far as longer term studies, is where acute studies are actually less likely to cause problems with cytotoxicity and the confounding effects of tissue repair process. Another issue to, con to consider during your exposure conditions is the ADME data or the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion data. It's very important to get this information before you start your study, if at all possible. Um, this data is from a study where we actually did not have that data available. It was considered a non-toxic compound, so we dosed up to 2,000 mg per kg, not only looking at the liver, but we also looked at multiple tissues because we did not know the distribution across the animal at the time of the study was conducted. What was discovered after the study was completed based on the ADME data that the compound actually concentrated in the liver after doses, at doses above 1,000 mg per kg after a single dose, and it actually concentrated in the liver and became hepatotoxic. So it was unmetabolized and not distributed to any tissues after that. Had we known this information before the study, we would not have dosed up to 2,000. We probably would have do included another lower dose of 250 to see if it was non-genotoxic at the non-cytotoxic doses. Um, and we also would not have necessarily evaluated the other tissues and wasted resources when we now know that it did not get distributed to those tissues. Tissue selection, it is common that um, one tends to want to evaluate the epithelial tissues because it's well known that that is typically the source of tumor generation. However, what we've discovered and has been supported by the literature is that actually damage in the extracellular matrix is more likely to be genotoxic, whereas the epithelial cells, they're apoptotic prone, so once they get damaged, they're more likely to die off and not necessarily express damage that would be detectable by comet. Um, instead, the extracellular matrix, the cells in that matrix and the fibroblasts and the leukocytes in that matrix, once they have damage induced due to inflammatory response or due to the initial injury response, they're more likely to upregulate cell migration or cell proliferation in the epithelial cells, which are not necessarily mutated, they're just proliferating. Another issue to be aware of is that you also have issues with inflammation at the site of contact. This is particularly important for the GI tract where you would administer a compound that is um, corrosive or may induce inflammation in the intestinal tract. This can actually result in genotoxicity that goes systemic in other tissues. So you, while there is a lot of focus on the site of contact and particularly, again, the epithelial cells, you may want to look at other tissues rather than the site of contact, particularly if you're test compound is corrosive or irritant. Um, tissues like the lymph nodes or other tissues or in the blood may be worthwhile evaluating. This has been demonstrated in multiple tissues across multiple tissues, in the mammary tissues as well as the mammary skin and bladder, the role of the fibroblasts versus the direct epithelial cells. And it's also been documented in the fourth stomach and other areas of the GI tract and even in the reproductive tract. One of these issues that impacts this is your vehicle, your choice of vehicle. We discovered across multiple studies that when we used a vehicle such as saline, we had very low migration in the liver and also very low migration in the duodenum. However, when we changed the vehicle to methyl cellulose, we also saw nothing in the liver, but we started seeing a statistically significant increase in migration in the duodenum compared to saline or water. When you added tween to the methyl cellulose, you see an even higher migration level. 
And then that is with the single, my, single administration. When you added a second administration, you see an even higher migration, and this is background level. So as you can see, the more administrations you add to this, these animals, the higher the migration gets and the closer to the positive control it becomes. Um, in these cases, and this again is not an effect of a test article, but the actual vehicle that you're pairing with your test article. Um, so this can increase your background levels to the point of decreasing sensitivity significantly and resulting in a false negative. Um, it can also exacerbate any genotoxic effect of your compound, making you have a false positive potentially as well. So that is something to be aware of, particularly in the side of contact and this tissue and the tissue you're evaluating. So in summary, homeostasis perturbations are more relevant to comet than necrosis and apoptosis. It would be worthwhile to use biomarkers for those, such as I mentioned, the diffusion or histopathology, but instead of looking for necrosis and apoptosis as your cytotoxicity marker, you may want to look for inflammation, low levels of inflammation or glycogen depletion. Acute exposures can minimize the confounding effects of cytotoxicity. This is appearing to make it a lot less questionable or easier to interpret the data that you generate with Comet versus the longer-term studies because you have too many confounding effects once you go into the longer-term exposures. Third point is that ADMA, ADME data is crucial to a well-designed study, and while it's not often obtained before conducting a Comet study, I would highly recommend having that information so that you can minimize waste of resources and time and effort um, in your study. And lastly, the tissue other than liver and the site of contact should be considered for evaluation. Um, this is very important because in many publications and in the recent OECD guidelines right now, they only talk about the liver specifically with some mention of the site of contact, but there are other tissues and other target organs you will need to evaluate and that regulators will want to know about, um, even though the regulations only mention those two tissues. If your compound, for example, the target organ is the pancreas, you can be rest assured that the regulators will be interested in seeing data from that tissue. Sorry, and then lastly, the tissue fibroblast cells may be more appropriate than the epithelial cells for evaluation, so you do want to focus on having um, sample from the entire tissue rather than trying to isolate a specific cell type, which may not be indicative of genotoxicity in the tissue. An example that actually is a good example, I guess, of, of these points is a particular that can be found in this particular study. It was a 28-day collaborative study on multiple compounds looking at the rat liver. Um, for all compounds, the same protocol, for the most part, of the same protocol design was used, um, and the same tissues were evaluated, the liver and also the duodenum. One particular compound that was evaluated was gemifloxacin mesylate, and this compound turns out in the three days in the three-day study, it was positive at 1,200 mg per kg, but it was negative in the 29-day study after 29 days of exposure. And this was an interesting result because it's known that gemifloxacin is a genotoxic agent. They also noted that they saw glycogen depletion at most of these doses as well, both at three days and at 29 days, but at the time they did not consider it relevant to the study. It turns out that this EMA report came out prior to that publication and prior to those study conduct um, on gemifloxacin and exactly why that compound was pulled or withdrawn, withdrawn. In that report, they assessed the fact that the target organ was actually the kidney. And so the kidney might have been a better tissue to evaluate for that particular study for the genotoxicity of that compound. Also, they noted that cytotoxicity, the Evidence of cytotoxicity was found in the kidney with inflammation and kidney damage at 600 mg per kg. So most likely those effects that were seen in the liver were a secondary systemic effect related to the inflammation at the, side of, at the kidney or the target organ. And interestingly enough, the ADMA, ADME data also revealed that the Tmax occurred after half an hour to two hours after an initial dose. 
So 29-day study, even a three-day study, may not have been necessary. This compound potentially could have been tested with a 24-hour exposure or even a six, four- to six-hour exposure would have been sufficient because, as they also found, there was no accumulation with the repeat doses, and the compound was completely excreted after 24 hours with no liver metabolism. Again, this supports the point that the liver may not have been the best tissue to evaluate for this study. So in conclusion, collect your ADME data before conducting the con at the study, if at all possible. And for cytotoxicity, evaluate homeostasis per perturbations for comet-relative cytotoxicity um, rather than looking for gross toxicity. You also want to avoid inflammatory, inflammatory doses of exposures because there's a lot of confounding effects. It will be difficult to interpret your data, whether it's genotoxic or cytotoxic, at those doses or exposures. And also, you want to review all available data to determine the best tissues to evaluate. Um, you don't want to base it just on the OECD guidelines or just on the side of contact in the liver um, because that will not be all that the regulators expect and when it comes time to submit your data. And that's the end of my presentation, so I hope this was helpful, and thank you very much for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Marie, for your presentation. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce and welcome today's third and final speaker, Mark Brown. He is the Director of Microscopy Systems Divisions at Andor Technology. Mark joined Andor in 2004 through the acquisition of Kinetic Imaging, where he was a founder and managing director. Mark is now responsible for the microscopy systems business at Andor. Prior to founding Kinetic Imaging, Mark was a lecturer at Reading University, senior lecturer at UMIST, and professor of engineering science at Lancaster University. A graduate of University of Edinburgh, he completed his PhD in engineering sciences at Reading University. So now I would like to hang, hand over the presentation to Mark. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, so, uh, I'm just waiting for my presentation to come up. Um, but basically, I'm going to tell you about Comet 7 and the new features that we've introduced, um, but also show you a little bit of background um, about the Comet assay. So, uh, as you've heard, uh, the Comet assay is a very flexible tool for the study of DNA integrity, damage, and repair. This is probably well known to many of you. The, uh, the assay can be applied to any eukaryote, uh, and so in that respect, it's a very flexible biomarker. Um, and as you've just heard from Marie, study designs uh, are critical, um, and by the right kind of study, you can use the Comet assay um, for safety testing, screening, mechanistics, diagnostics, and population studies. Sorry about that, finger trouble. So key applications here, as we just heard from Marie about uh, safety testing for new drugs, chemicals, or even medical devices, um, screening of drugs and compounds for uh, uh, weeding out um, early candidates to avoid spending a lot of money in preclinical or clinical trials, cancer research, as we heard an extremely interesting example from uh, Diana earlier in the day, uh, and also the study of mechanistics um, of toxicity at the cellular level. Uh, and I'm aware of studies that have been done looking at DNA, DNA cross-linking and protein cross-linking as well. Um, even looking at uh, epidemiology, study of populations which have been exposed in the workplace or the wider environment, um, and also in environmental studies, uh, looking at exposure to radiation or other pollutant runoff from factories and such like. Uh, and then the assay can be applied to local flora and fauna. And a very good example was, has been done uh, work by Alan DeVoe, uh, who's a French uh, researcher. So, <clears throat> just a quick uh, overview of the whole process. Uh, this is the alkaline comet assay, and if we start here at the top corner, 
sorry, uh, I'm not getting the, oh, here it is. Okay, sorry. So if we start here, usually we start with a hypothesis. This is a toxic compound or such similar hypothesis. This is followed by study design and then either in vivo or in vitro exposure. This may be environmental or it may be specifically applied. Uh, a cell preparation is taken, plated onto agarose. Uh, there's lysis in which a detergent is usually used to remove the cellular membrane. And then the cells are placed into a high pH uh, buffer, which is also the electrophoresis buffer typically. And at this high pH, we um, reveal not only uh, double strand, bre strand breaks, but also stringle strand breaks and alkali labile sites and adducts. So uh, then electrophoresis takes place after a period of unwinding. And as you know, with the familiar comet um, tail, we have this kind of, ex uh, of uh, expression here of the DNA damage spreading out into a tail uh, at different degrees of um, damage. After electrophoresis, slides are neutralized, stained, and then scored, and in our case with the Comet 7 or Comet GLP software. The data is then delivered into our database viewer where summary statistics are created. And then this data is fed directly in for statistical testing and a result with a confidence level, as Diana has explained beautifully, is presented uh, and informs our further study. So something you might not have seen, um, but was uh, shown by a young man called Alexander Rapp, who was at the IMB in Jena uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Here is a movie of a comet forming. So uh, if I click somewhere here, I think the movie should run. Oh, here we go. So you should be able to see the comet forming now. This is actually an image on live on the microscope that Alexander produced. And you can see the, as time goes on in the time lapse series, you can see the damaged DNA being dragged out into a tail. I hope you can see that clearly. So this is what happens. Of course, at the end of the day, we're scoring the, the, um, the finally exposed comet, uh, not this time lapse process. So this is what uh, we, we analyze with the comet assay software after staining. So you can see here a group of typical that are sh of comets that are shown um, on the Comet 7 software startup screen. Just a quick note here and a nod to our first customers who were in Belfast in Northern Ireland, uh, George McCurr and Valerie McKelvey-Martin, uh, who are now academics up at the University of Coleraine. Uh, Valerie, I think, had been to a course that was run by Marie and, they, and Ray Tice, uh, over at ILS in North Carolina. And when Valerie McKelvey came back, she was so excited by the Comet assay that she convinced us we should develop some software. And so in 92, we released the first version. Interestingly, in a, um, a, a, a full closure, if you like, uh, and or acquired the company that was running this, uh, that created this software, Kinetic Imaging, uh, in 2004, and now we're all um, headquartered in Belfast, um, and we still continue with the Comet software development. Comet 7 also has a GLP version, and the, we first introduced the GLP version in 2000 uh, with support from teams like Marie Vasquez's. So what have we done with Comet 7 and GLP? Well, we've updated it. So we've taken into account the recently adopted OECD guideline 489, that's the in vivo alkaline comet assay that was adopted in September. That's a great uh, watershed, I think, for the assay. It's been more than 25 years in coming to this point of ad uh, adoption, but it's well proven because of that. And the new requirements that have been in, published in the TG489 are presented or supported in the Comet 7 and database viewer. 
we've made it set Windows 7 compatible, and um, uh, it's fully Windows 7 certified, and Windows 8 will be coming in the not too distant future. We've supported new camera and illumination technologies, and specifically our new scientific CMOS camera, which has a very large field of view, similar to the oculars in the microscope. And the idea here is to speed scoring. Uh, and we also recommend LED light sources that are now so common in households. They're also finding their way into laboratories where they provide super long life they, they're very safe, uniform, and stable, and you can get rid of those nasty old mercury uh, arc lamps that are very hot and very nasty to handle. And we recognize that since we have hundreds of customers, we would like to provide cost-effective upgrade paths for those users. And of course, as always, when we do a software development, we fix any bugs that were known about, and we make the software as robust as possible. So I'm going to uh, just briefly say here that Comet GLP is compliant with OECD test guideline 489. Uh, it fulfills uh, the FDA 21 CFR part 11 guidelines for electronic data, which means it has audit trails and electronic signatures. Uh, and in line with GLP and part 11, it has dual level password protection. Um, and both Comet and Comet GLP share robust analysis algorithms that have been around since the 1990s. And once you've got good algorithms, it's important to stabilize and keep with them through new releases of the software, and that's what we've done. The products that we offer now include uh, adding to an existing fluorescence microscope or indeed supply of the microscope, the fluorescence light source and filters, the uh, LED here I've already mentioned. Uh, now, the basic CCIR cameras, of which we sold hundreds, I imagine, um, we recognize you may not have funds to upgrade to new cameras, so we're supplying a very cost-effective video USB adapter that will allow you to plug your existing camera into the modern computers that run Windows 7. We also have a Xyla 5.5 USB that I mentioned earlier that has a very large field of view. Uh, and would be a great addition if funds were available. And then the last but not least, the, the thing that we've introduced is the virtual camera, which means we can acquire from a live window on a computer screen uh, uh, images from any camera that you might happen to own. So our goal is to make Comet 7 software and the database viewer available to all users who may want to use it, whether they have funds for new hardware or not. So products include, you can acquire just the software itself, if you wish. Uh, there's also the GLP version, or we can supply workstations with optional accessories uh, of light sources and software. Uh, the Comet GUI has not changed drastically. You can see it's version 7. We've updated it a little bit. Um, to make it more compliant with the expected user interfaces of today. But in general, once you have a good design, we think we should stick with it, and we don't want you to have to go through a large learning curve if you're going to be upgrading the software. So this is the view. What I show here on the right is what a typical camera would show, uh, this field of view within the red, uh, and this larger field of view is what you would see with our new US, uh, SCMOS cameras. So the point is here really that you can see many more comets in the same uh, in a single view, and that means you should be able to score more quickly. Uh, on the left-hand side here, the usual stuff, the experimental status, the integrated intensity profiles that give you an idea whether you've got a sensible analysis. For example, you can look at the background as smooth here in the light blue color that I'm just drawing my cursor along. And here are your summary results table here uh, at the bottom of the screen. On the uh, other side of the uh, screen of your computer, you will see an image of the comets. And this is the region that is dropped over each comet to be scored. There's an automatic background region here, and then calipers are applied to give you visual feedback of the system scoring. Uh, 
Comet software is run through protocols which include all the Comet options, the calibration, uh, and the camera settings, so that once you have those set up, you can simply re-invoke them every time you start the software. Uh, the Comet software options allow us to control head thresholds, tail thresholds, and the like. And these are all have their own default values here. If you have existing values, you can reprogram them here. And we now default and encourage the use of the database viewer. Speaking of the database viewer, here is a quick look of the current version of it. Uh, this has now been updated a bit, but you'll see that we can load uh, databases created in the Comet software, allow you to visualize the individual cells and their scores, and to observe all kinds of formats of data in bar charts. 3D histograms are shown here. This is a 3D histogram. And uh, this is supplied with all versions of Comet, uh, and it knows the difference between research and GLP versions. It runs without a dongle, so that means you can share it to all uh, clients and customers and even use it for training your PhDs or postdocs who are going to get into the assay. You can write it out onto a CD or a USB, and notable features include galleries, uh, quick statistics functions, data decoding, and data summaries, uh, which I've already mentioned are compliant with the OECD guideline 489. So one quick way of reviewing your data is to look through galleries, as shown here. And you can also archive them in electronic printable formats as part of your record keeping if required. And perhaps the key thing for those people doing uh, safety uh, studies is the OECD compliance here. But we can generate speedy uh, data summaries for statistical testing. You can see here that we can apply log n transforms, as Diana mentioned, per slide medians, and meta median group analysis. Universal um, export format uh, is shown here also. That means you can output this data into any format. And so finally, in summary, uh, we'd just like to say uh, thank you for listening, but also to mention the key features here. Comet 7 and GLP are certified Windows compatible. We've updated them and improved them to minimize user fatigue and speed analysis. Uh, we supply the database viewer, viewer free to distribute uh, to allow analysis and visualization of all the data. 7 GLP is compliant with all the requirements for regulatory agencies. We will apply discounts to existing Comet users provide an easy upgrade path for you. We supply high-resolution cameras if you have funds, but if not, uh, we have the cost-effective video to USB converters for existing cameras. The virtual screen capture opens this software up to a wider range of viewers, and LEDs replacements for our lamp uh, are recommended and will provide safe long-term uh, performance for you. And that's the end of the presentation, uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for your time. Okay, thanks. Um, so um, we do have some questions that have come through um, through the, the chat function. Um, uh, we've gone just a little bit over time, but I will allow about five minutes um, for some uh, to uh, feed some of these questions to the speakers. So uh, the first question here is, um, are Comet assays ideal for yeast? Yeast cells are smaller in comparison to human cells. Will there be visible comets in yeast DNA damage? And I'm opening up the questions to either Mark or Marie, depending on who wants to answer. Go ahead on this one, Marie. Marie? Sorry, I keep messing up my mute button. Um, I don't think they're ideal for yeast. I think yeast is a little too small. It would be difficult to view, but I don't say that from personal experience at all. I just don't have any knowledge of anyone else successfully using Comet on yeast. Okay. Uh, next question. Is using the cover slip mandatory for Comet assay? 
I could be able to get better comments without using the cover slip while I have only two layers of agarose with 1% LMP agarose pre-coated, and then the cells mixed with LMP will be over-layered. I'm not sure if that is understandable, but uh, Mark or Marie? I would say that I think uh, the, comp the assay is u the uh, unwinding and electrophoresis is usually done without cover slips, I think, and it's only the cover slip is applied after staining, may so that so that this th it's probably just a misconception, but it may be may come from Diana's slide. Marie, would you like to comment? Yes, I agree with Mark that um, it seems like they may. This person may be asking about leaving the comment slip, off, the cover slip, on during the lysis and electrophoresis step. And, and Mark's right; you would remove it during those steps. You only use it one to spread the agarose onto the slide, and that is so that you get an even distribution of cells in one plane of view. Um, and then you would again add it again, back again um, after electrophoresis when you're adding the stain. And it was also to give you an even distribution of the stain. So um, I'm thinking that this person is just asking about during the processing, in which case you would not have a cover slip on. Okay, next question. What is the scale used in plotting the olive tail moment? Why is the controls different? Why, is, why do the controls differ in the pre-cancer and the control? And where is the 95% CI line in the graph? I'm not sure if this is Diane's presentation or... I think this is Diana. Um, but the scale is the units of the olive tail moment. The olive tail moment is the product of fractional DNA um, times a, or the, um, the migration center of gravity distance in microns. So um, I think that uh, I think maybe there's it, it, it's a, an interpretation of that. But I think we should apply the um, question to Diana so that she can answer in writing, perhaps. Okay, we'll forward it to her for a response. Uh, next question, can this assay be adapted to assess genetic toxicity of chemicals, et cetera? And the answer is yes. That is oh. actually how it is used. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> next question. It is very hard to suggest that comet assay could be used as a pre-screening pre test if someone has cancer, especially because there's no standardization. So my question is, is there going to be any committee in the future which will set a standardized protocol for comet assay? That's an interesting question. Um, I think that uh, it's taken 20 uh, five years nearly to get Comet to this point. Hopefully it won't take another 25 to move it forward in clinical co the clinical context. But um, the inclusion of internal controls, which Diana showed, is the key way to do this. And I know Marie would have quite a lot to say about that in the safety testing context. Would you like to add anything, Marie? Um, yes, I actually think that it should be used in clinical trials, I think that be including that data, taking that endpoint, common assay endpoint from clinical trials where there's smaller populations and you can have more statistical strength in the data, taking pre and post treatment um, would be very helpful towards moving into the clinical aspects and biomonitoring aspects with Comet. Um, but as of yet, I don't think it's been fully embraced. Okay, I'm going to put out one last question and then all the remaining questions we will have to follow up with offline. This is for Marie. Uh, what are your thoughts on a Genotox test battery with only a single positive in the Comet assay? Would you believe that a compound was genotoxic if it was negative in names, in vitro micronucleus or chrome abs and negative in vivo micronucleus but positive in comet duodenum. Assuming the compound has good sy systemic exposure, would you recommend any follow-up testing for WOE? Um, I might. It depends on what other data is available. If there are, is evidence that there is irritation or um, inflam inflammation in the GI tract or in the duodenum specifically, then it would be most likely attributed to that, but I would have to do 
more research to see if not low enough doses were evaluated. At most, I would recommend doing an additional study at lower doses if those doses were all um, corrosive or irritating to the GI tract. But no, I'm not likely to call it positive based on that evidence alone. Okay, I'm sorry, that's, I'm afraid that's all the time we have uh, for questions. Um, so I want to thank you all for your participation and for submitting some really excellent questions. Um, any questions that we were unable to answer today due to time constraints will be passed on to the speakers who will then try to contact you later for an answer. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all speakers for their presentations and to also thank the attendees of today's webinar. This has been a very informative webinar with a lot of thoughtful questions and answers. Thank you, everyone, and I wish you all a great day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.